Hi everybody. Uh, we're going to start our neck journey is what I've decided to call it because there's a lot to this neck, the neck of a guitar. I am going to try and explain the best of my ability what the problems and uh, issues are with neck and uh, how I've chosen to, to try and solve them in my own work. So um, this is going to be a long series of, of shows and uh, I hope you like them. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in with just a quick overview of what happens in my shop making an archtop guitar neck. Now let's, here we'll start with a finished article, if we probably hear. This is a uh, 25 and a half inch scale neck with 22 frets. Pretty normal fingerboard surface, uh, 10 inch arc radius down here, 13 inch arc radius up here, about 12 at the 12th fret, just as you would expect. You can see there's a, a pin here that forms the neck joint of this guitar and it's uh, made of carbon fiber and high temperature epoxy. Now, don't get the idea that I'm going to blow over this stuff and not explain it. We're going to do every single part of this in great detail, but I just wanted to give you an overview today so that you can, um, you can know what to expect and what some of the components and processes are like. All right, so there's a finished article. What this is, is uh, several pieces of material joining together to help create a, this, uh, this dependable neck, uh, including carbon fiber. Here's some of that. This is unidirectional carbon fiber, which means that the carbon is non-woven and all the carbon fibers are aligned in the in the direction of the braid. This is a braided tube. You can see that it's a, a tubular structure. And this is something that's made for me by a friend who's got a braiding machine. What a surprise. Anyhow, that's carbon fiber. And then these white strands are glass fibers. And they're just there to keep it in columns so that it's easy to handle. Because take it from me, without some kind of structure, Zero degree carbon fiber is a real nightmare. It's kind of a, a mess when you're trying to paint it with resin and get it to wet out so that you can use it properly. It just, it's just impossible to deal with it. It breaks, it balls up, it makes a big mess. Anyhow, so uh, we're gonna get deep into this whole carbon fiber thing, but just wanted to familiarize you with, this is the material that I like to start with. And then, you can see in this part that there's a core material made of Douglas fir. So that's, that part looks like this. So it's a neck shape, but smaller than a neck, of course. And then you can see on the back side, there's a piece of veneer. And you can see the veneer on this part as well, I believe. And then in between the neck core and the neck veneer is the carbon fiber braid that we were just looking at, okay? Now, that braid not only reinforces the neck itself, but it also gathers through a hole in the veneer and becomes this pin. The fibers that you're seeing here are also going in this direction and in this direction. And again, I'll show you exactly how I do it and, and what happens. While we're in this view, you can see inside that there's, there's a bushing, a threaded bushing in here that's used to control the height of the neck off the body and thereby control the action of a guitar, okay? So let's back up a little bit and I'll show you how this works. Over here we have the components of the neck veneer. So that would be one piece of yummy veneer. This is curly Italian chestnut. I have a clear template so I can play around with it and get the grain orientation 
the way I want for the neck. And then this is a piece of nice friendly linen. It's about, I think about 10 thousandths thick, eight or 10 thousandths thick, two tenths of a millimeter. It's a plain weave, but I think you can see that I've cut it out on the bias. This is something that some of you have seen in a previous show where I've used this reinforcing method to bend sides. When you're bending a side, of course, you're bending in this direction, but to make a neck veneer, we're gonna to have to get it to bend in this direction. And as you probably know, at 1.5 millimeters or 1 16th of an inch, actually this is a little shorter, a little smaller than that, maybe a couple tenths of a millimeter smaller, 55 thousandths maybe. Even at this thin section, the, the, the idea of bending this into a neck shape like this, here's a finished one, without some kind of trickery, it just doesn't seem possible. And I can pretty much tell you that it isn't possible. <laughs> so here's the trickery, is that we glue the linen to the back of the veneer while it's flat. And then that changes the way the material bends and tension and compression. I'll make a little drawing and show you what I think about that. Well, we're gonna do my, my favorite diving board. So here's our diving board. And um, here, here it is clamped to the swimming pool deck. And here you are uh, standing on the diving board. So you're exerting a downward force on the end of the diving board and the diving board will respond by bending like this a little bit, exaggerated for clarity, right? So when the diving board bends, we know that the fibers on the top of the diving board are getting longer. So they're being stretched in tension. And then the fibers on the bottom of the board are getting shorter. If they weren't, it couldn't bend, right? So stands to reason that somewhere in between getting longer and getting shorter, there has to be some place in here where neither of those things happens and the, it, it changes from compression to tension. Does that make sense? All right, so then this imaginary line, or actually it's, it's a real place, but it's hard to tell exactly where that is. It isn't necessarily right in the middle, in other words, depends on the properties of what the diving board is made out of. But at any rate, let's just say it's right in the middle for now. That means that right in the middle, there's a place, a plane, that is, that goes all the way across the board that is not either getting shorter or longer. And so we're gonna call that a neutral plane, all right? Take this piece of wood here and we're gonna use our diving board scheme. When we wanna bend this, we know that the, the inside of the bend is gonna get crushed together, right? And the outside of the bend is gonna get stretched apart, right? Stretching is tension, crushing is compression. So, and I don't have to demonstrate this to you, but if I, if I do this and I keep pushing, it's gonna split because the wood will fail on the outside of the bend, it'll fail in tension, okay? So, the point of this linen, our friendly linen, is that it is gonna bond to the neck veneer and it will change where this neutral plane is, okay? And it's gonna move that neutral plane all the way out to this surface or really close to it. So in other words, what it will do is it'll induce all of the material in the neck to be compressively loaded instead of loaded in tension. And that means that we can crush the inside of the surface, this side of the surface, without damaging anything. There won't be any problem. It won't, be, it won't distort, you can see how 
you can see how nicely it's bent. Uh, really is a, a nice structure. Here's another, another one of different species. But it really bends beautifully. And the linen is our friend here because the linen is being bias cut. That is, we're cutting it 45 degrees to the length of the roll. That means that half the material is, um, is going in this direction and the other half of the material is going in this direction. And what that means is that when we try and bend this, we have both of these fibers loaded equally. So all the fibers, whether they're plus 45 or minus 45, right? Again, this is zero. Um, this is 90. Is that right? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is this is ninety, and um, and then so these are we're, these we're calling plus or minus forty five, and by by using it as a bias cut, then we're we're going to enable all of the fibers in the in the fabric to do the same job, which is to resist the loads of tension. Okay, and um, again, you can see how well it works. Okay. Oh, well, let me just say, let's say we didn't bias cut it. Let's say that here was our veneer and we were going to use straight cut material right from the roll, the 090. Well, we see when we try and bend it, first of all, only half the fibers have any chance of helping us. These zero degree fibers are not going to do anything, right? It's only these um, 90 degree fibers here that are going to be assisting in moving the neutral plane towards the convex or tension side of the bend. Now, they're, they're going directly across the wood. So at some point, they're going to burst the same way the wood would want to burst because they're being loaded so sharply and they don't have anywhere to go. Now, in, in a, but what I mean by anywhere to go, these 45 degree fibers can kind of shift a little bit and uh, absorb some stress while they're subtly moving. Believe me, everything moves. So that's why this plus or minus 45 degree fiber orientation is so much better than zero 90 degree fiber orientation. So let's have a look at what we did yesterday. I, I glued one of these up to show you so here's our curly chestnut. Under pressure. And the thing is that when you glue these, when you glue the cloth to the to the wood, you want to make sure that you use the smallest amount of resin that you can possibly get away with and get a good bond. The reason for that is you do not want the resin to leak into this wood, be absorbed by the wood, and stiffen it, right? Because we know that if we get epoxy involved with wood, it tends to stiffen the material by supporting it in a new way, right? Uh, by being absorbed by the wood and supporting it. So, we don't want that. So, I took every precaution, and again, I'll show you in real time how this works, but just to quickly describe it to you, I took every precaution to put the smallest amount of epoxy that I could get on this linen. And I didn't wet the, I didn't wet the, um, the wood side at all. I just, I just got the, um, I just got the, the, the linen wet, and then I put the dry wood on top of it. So, all right. By the way, this is a nice plastic tape that works as a great release system. And now you can see the fibers going plus or minus 45. The fibers are all wet. You don't see any holidays or dry spots. 
course, in any composite layup, if you have um, dry material, you don't have anything, basically. You know, the whole idea of a composite material is a combining of two things to create a new kind of structure. And if you don't have If you don't have wet fibers, you won't get the properties that you're hoping to get. It just won't happen. It'll be weak. And dry fibers are a problem in any kind of composite layout. <laughs> anyway, I'm trimming this now because I just glued it. Well, it wasn't even 24 hours ago. And you may be able to see this kind of carving nicely as it advances to cure over the next, I don't know, couple days maybe. It'll get a lot harder to cut. So I'm just doing this. Well, if, really, I'm just doing it for fun. But I'm doing it to show you that this is the right time to do this is kind of the day after the glue up so that you don't have a bunch of hard sharp linen because you've you turned this nice soft happy linen into a whole different material when you soak it with epoxy and uh, anyway so there it is all trimmed up and ready to bend again i'll show you this in full detail but i can promise you that you can this will bend Beautifully, we're gonna we're gonna moisten it with a special chemical sauce, and uh, I'll show you exactly how this works. What happens to this next is it gets bent with that chemical sauce, and then it goes into this tool, and this is a just a simple clamping tool that that will change this part into this part shape, right? So, so that's how that works. That goes here and then this is a piece of uh, hose with, um, with ends on it so that I can pressurize it with compressed air. And then this guy uh, is a top member of this thing so that we can hold it all together um, when it's bent in there with these these little clamps I made and um, and then when we pressurize the hose we get serious even pressure everywhere and we get a beautiful result okay then we get this all right so that's the first layer the outside we already kind of looked at the carbon fiber this is the inter intermediate material uh, in between the veneer and the core material. Now, let's discuss the core and its attributes. I love using Douglas fir for this, for this job. It's just an amazing material. If you get a good close-up of this particular piece, you can see how finely grained it is. Amazing. So slow. That tree grew so slowly. Just off quarter. That is the fibers are not exactly perpendicular to the material. And then here's another piece of Douglas fir that has grain lines that are substantially wider. You can see, gosh, this one that's two years in, you know, six millimeters or almost a, a quarter inch it grew in two years. So very different uh, tree, very different growing conditions, and we get very different properties. This piece of material is significantly lighter, believe it or not, than this one. And it's one of the attributes of Douglas fir that's uh, kind of entertaining. And that is that, at least in my experience, as a species, it is more variable than any other kind of wood I've ever worked with. As I understand, it's all the same, you know, botanically, Douglas fir is Douglas fir, and, uh, and yet some of it is, 
is so light it almost uh, approaches cedar, uh, western cedar in, in weight, or really any juniper. Uh, very light in the 20, low 20 cubic uh, pounds per cubic feet. And we'll have to do a metric equivalent for the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and then some of it is, is just diabolically heavy. It's crazy heavy. Uh, and as heavy as, um, you know, a lot of deciduous trees, as heavy as what we would consider heavy hardwoods. So I get to pick what I like. I don't really like the heavy stuff that much. But um, there are, these do have different sonic properties. And we could talk about that. But speed of sound in this material is excellent. These are tapping very differently. Anyhow, I love Douglas fir and I have used it almost exclusively for this job. Here's another wide grain piece. Look at that beautiful stuff. Whew. Of course, it kind of makes a nice detail on the side of the headstock. If it's really vertical, then you get, you know, this kind of picket fence look over here. Or the grain lines marching up the headstock edge. Here's another one. This one is um, this one is just off quarter, as you say, not quite 90. Uh, and you can see that the the picket fence thing is gone. We don't have that. We, so because it's just beginning to be rifts, you can see it tilting on the edge. And then here we can see there's one other spot. So the Douglas fir, you can see on three sides of the headstock, the way I'm doing this right now. And the headstock is faced and then uh, also supported on the back with ebony or some other material. This is an interesting neck. Uh, it's an experiment. I don't know about this one. But this one is, uh, this green material is something I've used before that I love, which I believe is cucumber magnolia. A little bit difficult to get it identified. The Forest Products Laboratory told me it was poplar, but it most certainly is not yellow poplar. Whatever it is, it grows in America. <laughs> and it's medium weight, medium stiffness, and the sound is fantastic. It has a huge sustain, very high Q number. So. And then this interesting material here is uh, lignum vitae, a South American hardwood that's pretty much unavailable. But this is um, some big pieces that I bought 40 years ago that I'm just starting to use now. So, so that's, a, that's an advertisement for sitting on some of your stock, I guess. All right, so the way this all works is the neck veneer, which we said started out like this, gets cut. Gets cut a couple different ways. It has a, a square hole cut here to, um, to line up with a hole in the mold. And then, of course, it, that creates the carbon fiber pin. And when the, when the neck comes out of the mold, it has, of course, the core material with the veneer on the back side and the carbon fiber in the middle. And there's a lot of good things that you get that come right out of the mold. The, the neck joint's done. The neck joint's perfect. It can't come out anything but perfect. It's exactly the right everything. All the angular relationships are perfect. The size, it just comes out great because it comes out of this uh, precision mold that I built. And down the center of this uh, pin is a chunk of spruce. And this I sized um, so that it's, it's big enough to force all of the carbon fibers to the outside of the uh, square neck pocket where it can do the most good structurally. So that's where we would want it, uh, not down the middle, but out the sides of this, this square neck pin. Pardon me, square neck pin. And um, that way we get the best, we get the best stiffness out of the part. So you can see that that pin, you know, by the time 
we put in this metal bushing to adjust the height, the pin is gone. Oh, that's the end of the pin we use, but the pin is gone. It doesn't exist there anymore, having been cut away. So after the neck comes out of the mold, I don't have one in exactly that stage, but you know, this one's pretty close. After the neck comes out of the mold, we, we cut off a, a scrap that, that sticks out here, and then there's another scrap at the end of the neck that gets discarded. And then this decorative piece gets glued on. Uh, it does stiffen the neck to some extent, that's not really why I use it, but it does stiffen the neck. I just like it <laughs> because here it has stripes and over here it doesn't have any stripes usually. And so the stripes kind of get sanded off until there's no, uh, just one piece of material at the end. Okay. Then after that, this backstrap part, goes on, that's kind of a big deal, but I'll show you, again, I'll show you everything in full detail, excruciating detail, you'll see what I do, how I prepare this surface precisely, and then um, bond the, the back strap here. Now, this is a really important piece of material, and as any of you know, who have been playing with guitars for very long, this is a fragile part of a lot of guitar neck. Some not so much, others very fragile. Of course, it stands to reason that the neck itself is tapering down to its smallest size here. And then also the headstock is uh, intersecting the neck shape and, and uh, there's some kind of angle that where a, a headstock joins. So there's a headstock angle, which on my guitars is four and a half degrees because it's the lowest angle that I can achieve, that I can get to work, and um, I'll, again, I'll explain my headstock and neck design ideas in full detail, so we'll get to that at some point. Anyhow, um, then after that, the, the fingerboard and the headstock veneer get glued on. They join here in a simple butt joint, which um, is invisible, uh, if you do it right, and uh, so there's a butt joint right here, and then the nut sits on top of that. So there's no slot for the nut; it just perches on there and holds the strings. And again, we're gonna we're gonna deeply analyze <laughs> everything we can think of uh, about the neck, and I'll try and explain to the best of my ability how it all works and. and why I do it this way. So I guess I have forgotten to tell you one thing is that this is a tool that, that I machined in my little hand milling machine and sandpaper a long time ago. And it's a, a really nice neck shape with a neck pin hole in it, of course. And it has, it has heaters in it. It's got resistance heaters. And then when all the parts are in there, the the veneer and the carbon fiber and the resin that sticks it all together and um, the neck core, then this part is a clamp that goes on top. 14 screws come in here and, and crush this down in and make sure that there's no empty spaces or bubbles so that there's um, you know perfectly void free layup. And uh, this applies quite a bit of pressure. I think we calculated it as about around 15,000 pounds, um, which, you know, is enough to do the trick. So, um, molded neck 101, I guess that's pretty much what I wanted to show you today. We're going to get started and get in, uh, involved in all the little uh, drama and decisions and uh, reasoning for uh, choosing to, to do this very complicated uh, neck assembly method. All right, till next time, the neck journey.